Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to open up this morning the State of the College and have so many um, of our um, members of our community of the Roy Myers College of Nursing. And I want to welcome a number of our new board members who will be uh, joining us later today for a first uh, official start off of a number uh, of a uh, of a focus on this particular year, but also looking at the future of nursing here. So I want to thank all of you for joining us, and I hope that you can mingle at the reception afterwards and, and um, learn and uh, greet one another. So this morning, um, one of the things that we want to do is, you know, we always do this state of the college a little later in the year. Um, so I've challenged um, everyone to do it earlier. Um, but there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is we've just had the wonderful inauguration of our new president, Andrew Hamilton. And we want to pick up on his message and his energy and kick off with our uh, State of the College um, forward. So um, with um, that, I want to ask Andy to come up and give some opening remarks. Come on up, Andy. Many of you have uh, heard Andy speak, but not everyone, Andy. So you have some new audience. <laughs> and, and President Hamilton, um, I have my notes, is actually the 16th president. It's easy to remember because it's 2016. And so we don't get that number wrong. But he came to us um, last year um, in January and was just inaugurated in a, and installed as our new president. He's most recently served, as many of us know, as vice chancellor at Oxford University. And he, there he was the university's senior officer. He um, additionally was provost um, at Yale. And when I first met Andy, he mentioned to me that the first dean he hired at Yale was the dean of nursing, Margaret Gray. And so he's, um, you know, and I filled Margaret Gray's job when she left Penn to go to <laughs> Yale. So um, there's, a, there's a, a little stream here. Uh, he also spent time at the University of Pittsburgh and, and Princeton throughout his career. He is a biochemist, so he's very interested, of course, in the science part of nursing and health um, colleges and what we have to offer. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Andy to make some remarks, and then um, we'll begin. And he's going to stay with us, um, and as well brought his leadership team with him, Bob Byrne, Katie Fleming, our new provost. And did I see Uli there? No, not yet. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, very much indeed. Uh, I have to confess, I don't like this idea of, because it's 2016, I must be the 16th president, because that suggests that in 2017, you're going to have a new president, uh, and in 2018, that doesn't sound very uh, good to me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's the first opportunity as the president of NYU that I've had a chance to speak at the state of the college event for the College of Nursing, and I'm delighted to, as, as Eileen said, my first in exposure <laughs> as an academic leader to nursing was at Yale, and I can assure you Margaret Gray did a very good job in instilling in me the importance of nursing, the role that nursing has to play of course, in the world, but also especially in universities and the con central connections that it can make to so many other schools. I wanted to touch upon a, a few of those uh, thoughts and comments. As Eileen said, this has been an unbelievably busy eight, nine days. We began a week of celebration of the inauguration last week, and we had just every day a series of events celebrating what is good, what is best about NYU. Lots of student engagement, lots of student activities, lots of academic focus, of, of cutting-edge research, particularly research that crosses across borders. And we had a wonderful session at the College of Nursing, where we talked about many different aspects of aging and, and how the nursing uh, world is approaching and researching and providing insights into care and, and better life for, for uh, an aging population. And so for me, 
this whole event then came to culmination on Sunday where we had an inauguration event at Skirball and it's been uh, a wonderful but exhausting few days and I'm just thrilled that one of my first sessions after the, uh, the inauguration and a full board meeting that we had uh, and Howard Myers very much was a present and important contributor at the board meeting that to be able to speak to the College of, of Nursing. And so let me recognize what a wonderful year the College of Nursing has had. Let me recognize the leadership of Eileen Sullivan Marks and her team, all of you who are part of the College of Nursing. This has been a very exciting year. I'm not going to steal Eileen's thunder and, and the, 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 the steady rising in, in the rankings, the move into the magnificent new building that we see on the slide, and to top it all off, the just magnificent generosity of Rory and Howard Myers and the naming of the, of the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. This has been an incredibly exciting year, and I've been privileged to at least have been part of three quarters of it since arriving in January. I wanted just to say again, very briefly, uh, a few words about where I see, I see the, the, the College of Nursing as absolutely critical in NYU's landscape of, of, of both academic and, of course, health care activities. Uh, to me, one of the remarkable uh, impressions that my first nine months at NYU have left on me is just is the scale of the institution. That's very easy to, to, to appreciate with the 57,000 students that we have, the nearly 10,000 faculty, 12,000 staff. This is a small to mid-sized city in the middle of this great metropolis of New York City. And to me, one of the most important lessons that I've, I've learned in these first nine months is that, is that we are a university that, of course, is in and of the city. That's a line we say often. But we are very much distributed around the city. And this is something that I think we often underappreciate at NYU. And I would argue within the city of New York. Yes, this historical home here in Greenwich Village in Washington Square. But to look at the College of Nursing with its neighbors, the NYU Langone Medical Center, the College of Dentistry, we've got Charles Bartolami here, the Dean of the College of Dentistry, the College of Global Public Health. We have on First Avenue, clustered around this building and on the other side of the street with so much other activity. We have one of the great centers of health, research, teaching, and clinical provision in the United States. And that center, that environment, is on a remarkable trajectory. The College of Nursing is going up and up. The Langone Medical Center is going up and up. The College of Dentistry is going up and up, growing impact ever greater in the city and in the United States. And of course, we have a brand new School of Global Public Health, which again is really infused with energy and, and, and ambition and will itself become a major force in NYU's health pantheon. And so for me, that that location on First Avenue is a key part. I've, I've often referred to this as a triangle, an inner triangle in New York City. Washington Square, the First Avenue corridor, and now, increasingly, in the last decade or so, Brooklyn. We've seen with the return of engineering to NYU, the creation of the Tandon School of Engineering, formerly Brooklyn, Poly uh, uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic, uh, we've seen a real infusion of what it's unthinkable that NYU in the 21st century would not have cutting-edge technology, cutting-edge engineering, and we now have it, 
and it is like so many other parts of, of NYU on a really upward trajectory. I'm thrilled by the links that are now starting to be forged among those three corners of the inner triangle, Brooklyn, First Avenue, and Greenwich Village. It's great the connections the College of Nursing is making with engineering, the dentistry and medicine, the natural links to departments and, and, and colleges here in Washington Square. And so for me, I think the future for NYU is very bright. I think the future for the College of Engineering as we really exploit the benefits of scale that NYU now offers. And I'll give you one example of that scale, which will allow me to then move quickly into a, 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 a focus on other issues that I view as very important in these first few months of my presidency. NYU has 25,000 undergraduates. And of those 25,000, 22% of them are Pell Grant recipients. Some of you will know Pell Grant is a federal program to provide financial support to the lowest income, the, the, the most disadvantaged students in American society. 22%. That is a very high percentage, far higher than all of, uh, far higher than Yale and Harvard and, and, and Penn and, and other universities like that. Uh, but then when you multiply that 22% by our 25,000 undergraduates, that's 5,400 Pell Grant recipients studying at NYU. Well, let me tell you, that number is more than the Pell Grant students studying at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, and Duke combined. You really get a sense that NYU more than any other university in the nation is affecting the life chances of these disadvantaged young people in a deeply profound and positive way. And really, for me, that is a vital part of what I see among the highest priorities for NYU in the coming months and years, affordability. No, we need to be sure that that fundamental mission of NYU, founded in, 18, 20, in 1831, that fundamental mission of, of offering education to the city of New York, now, of course, we go far beyond the city and into the world, that that education is available to all. And it won't surprise all of you in this room that the cost of attendance at NYU is very high. We like to be near the top of rankings, but there's one ranking we don't like to be near the top of, and that's the highest cost of attendance in the nation. And for the last several years, we've been very close to that level for our undergraduate students. And so we've made just focusing on affordability a very, very high priority. Of course, a key component of, of affordability is financial aid and the momentum campaign, the billion dollar momentum campaign that NYU has been focused on for the last several years is a key part of that. And I am just thrilled that of the Rory and Howard Myers gift, three quarters of that was dedicated towards financial aid for first-generation low-income students in the College of Nursing. And, and there, there is nothing more honorable, there's nothing more important than that commitment and that vision. So we are continuing to focus very much on the raising of financial aid in our fundraising, but we're also getting a, a, a control of the other side. And so this year we have made a very strong point of keeping tuition increase to the lowest level in 20 years. We did something this year. One of the problems with NYU, our tuition is not at the top of the pack. It's more in the middle. But what rockets us up to the top in overall cost of attendance is, of course, the cost of living in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And so this year we did something, we froze the cost of room and board for our undergraduates. And so that's led to an increase in cost of attendance of just 2% for 
far below all of our peer institutions and the lowest level in well more than 20 years. And so we are committed to affordability. We are committed to working with our friends, supporters, donors to help increase financial aid. But we recognize the responsibility that we have to make sure that costs do not continue to rise at such a, a difficult and, and, and demanding level. Let me touch upon another topic as well, because of course it's utterly connected to affordability, and that's diversity. And NYU is a university that was founded, as I said, in 1831, to be open to a wide range of, of, of New Yorkers and, and residents of New York State in particular in those days. Uh, and, and to be a, a more accessible university than, for example, the elite institutions, the Harvards, the Yales, the, what was then King's College, Columbia. And we have a history of which we can be proud. We have been open to women students. We've been open to African-American students and to Jewish students and to other ethnic minorities at a time when other universities were not. However, we've got a past that is also not without blemish. We've got a past that we do need to recognize and understand that we are far, far from a perfect institution. And I've been very pleased since arriving at NYU how deeply engaged the university is in a, a, an institutional discussion about the nature of diversity, inclusion, and equity at NYU. It's a discussion that began last fall with a town hall meeting that many hundreds of students, faculty, and staff attended. It continued with a very powerful, very engaged task force, which is bringing forward new ideas, new thoughts, new approaches to ensuring that the experience of all our students, but especially the students from marginalized groups, that those students encounter in the classroom, in the faculty offices, in the administrative offices, a truly welcoming and inclusive place. And that has not been their experience to date. And I think this is what has been most powerful for me, listening to the stories of our students in particular, but also some of our faculty and staff, that it's not always been the case. We've begun to take some real steps. We're in the process of recruiting a chief diversity officer. We're in the process of, we have already instituted a bias report line so that anyone can report an instance of discrimination or bias in their daily experience. We're beginning to really identify key strategic areas where we can improve the experience of all our students. I've touched upon a number of, of areas, some to, that are very exciting, some that are rather sobering as we consider NYU in 2016. But I have to confess one of the areas that I find really energizing and, and enlightening is, is when I speak with Dean Sullivan Marks and when I hear about the great things going on at the College of Nursing. And so this is more than enough from me. I'm now going to sit down and get what I hope will be an annual fill-up, an annual uh, stimulation of listening, the ambitions, the commitment, the engagement of the College of Nursing in so many ways in this city, but far beyond into the rest of the country and the world. I know well many, many exciting global activities are going on as well. So thank you all very much for being here. Members of, of the board, thank you for your commitment to the College of Nursing. This is a part of NYU that really matters. And Howard, to you and to Rory in particular, thank you for your commitment and your absolutely steadfast loyalty to the college. Thank you. Thank you, and, and throughout uh, this morning, we're going to touch on those uh, three themes as uh, we move ahead. 
So um, what I wanted to start us whoops, off with, so the screen that you see is smaller than the screen that I see, is bigger than the screen that I see. So let's do this so that the um, little... Sense. My name is Rachel Leska. My name is Jake Hernandez. Zisha Holyfield. I'm Angela. Kevin Patrick Mendoza. I go by KP. My name is Samantha Bennett. My name is Mark DeSouz. I'm an accelerated nursing student. I chose NYU because it's a great school. NYU is kind of like in the epicenter of New York City. We're actually in the middle of everything. You see so much and, and get to experience life in such a unique way. It's like always on the go. New York City is just an amazing place to learn. The professors here at NYU Myers are experts in the field of nursing. They're passionate about the work that they do and that attitude is so contagious. We have two simulation floors where student nurses can practice different techniques. And it just provides a simulation unlike any other. So that we are very prepared and competent for real life on top of the clinical hours. It's good to have the opportunities that NYU Myers has given me. My internship actually dealt with uh, memory loss and aging at the Center for Brain Health. I knew that I wanted to be a part of a successful group of nurses. Since I've been here, it's actually really instilled a lot of pride in me. As nurses, we make a difference in people's lives, and so often I've left school just feeling so excited about the future. Every day I'm at NYU Myers, it just makes me more excited to become a nurse. So thanks to uh, Keith um, Olson and Dave uh, Resto for this new uh, video that is on the front page of our new website, which um, you can enjoy. But that was just a marvelous idea when we thought about um, what to highlight, and it's our students. So a reminder a little bit about our mission. So our mission, um, when we refocused it uh, in 2013, is to generate knowledge through research and education, health, and interdisciplinary science, but we also educate leaders in nursing to advance healthcare locally and globally, and we provide innovative and exemplary health care. So we provide care as well through our partners at Langone Medical Center, through our own um, innovative research, and we shape the future of nursing through the leadership that we have in healthcare policy, and that's been true at NYU nursing since its beginning here in 1935, as NYU is known um, as, the as a leader and a shaper of nursing. Our vision is that as this global leader, we advance healthcare for all people where they live, play, work, and learn. In our strategic plan, we identified core values. And just to highlight, so diversity is one of our core values that we um, uh, recognized. Innovation, driving quality, and promoting respect and collegiality among ourselves. So those were core values that we established and continue to operate on. But we also established operating assumptions because you can have values, missions, and goals. But if you don't assume that every day when you operate, you don't um, get to that point, you do that with these assumptions. And one is transparency. The other is that data drives our decision making. And that we're always mindful that we're a community of many voices. There isn't one way of doing anything. And we've um, stayed to that course as we go through our strategic goals. So I want to highlight our strategic goals and then where um, we've been in the last year, or the last two years, and on October 18th, we'll be having an all-school retreat to look at these goals halfway through the five-year strategic plan. So this is a good feeder into that day. So we've looked at our strategic goals, and overall, we're very pleased on the first two and a half years of our metrics. Our continuing quality improvement committee at the school's been looking at this, and we are on target for about 85 to 90 percent of all of those goals year by year. So our first goal, recruit and retain faculty who are national global leaders in research, education, and of course, innovation and in practice and policy. So a few highlights in that area that I wanted to talk about. In order to do that, we need endowed professorships. And I want to um, announce that we have uh, waiting for trustees' approval, maybe the committee met this week, um, that we've proposed and can, um, with matching gifts, put together the dean's chair in global health, as well as a chair in health equity and diversity. We're waiting on some final um, 
uh, development funds for that, but we will, we're very much on target and I hope to be um, soon announcing those officially. And that um, means that we also need to focus on diversity in our hiring practices. And our diversity and inclusivity committee is working with our search committee starting this year to look at some operational things they can put into place for that. Our faculty retention is very good. And so we're very pleased in that. And actually, Deb Chun was telling me the other day on the back of an envelope numbers, she walked into my office and she said, do you know we've hired 31 new faculty in the last four years? And I'm like, well, we had 13 openings when I started, so that makes sense. Um, but uh, some of those are um, adjunct faculty. But we've been extremely busy in recruiting and retaining faculty. Our faculty are leaders, and one of the benchmarks we use as leaders is what is their impact in publications, in research publications. And we have uh, two faculty who are editors of two top nursing journals, Nursing Research, which is in the top 10 of impact factors in nursing journals, Deb Chun, and um, an editor, that we, a person that recruited um, last year, Sally Cohen, who's editor of Policy, Politics, and Nursing Practice. And as important, we have 14 faculty who sit on editorial boards of journals. We also have faculty who've been recognized in leading um, organizations as fellows. And these mean that you have to demonstrate a high level of impact. We have 16 fellows in the American Academy of Nursing, um, um, the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, Jerry, I think that's a typo. It's New York Academy of Medicine, but since we're the newest special interest group there and we're taking over, we might have to change the name. We have 12 people at the New York Academy of Medicine. Two fellow, well, <laughs> Jerry's past president of the New York Academy of Medicine and on our board, and we're thrilled to have him. Uh, two in the American Heart Association. Uh, five fellows in the Gerontological Society of America and um, 12 um, American Association of Nurse Practitioners. And the reason this is really important, things like US News and World Report rankings, other external, look on our website to see who's identified themselves as fellows. And that's one of the benchmarks. It's very important. So this is excellent. Faculty diversity in the health professions is a major challenge. Um, these are the numbers, according to the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, of the percent of minority nursing faculty, and that includes underrepresented groups, African American, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and um, Asian Pacific Islander, Native Americans, and others. So this has been um, on the rise, particularly um, of, as a result of the Sullivan Commission, Lewis Sullivan Commission, which I'll mention next. But as you see, the, the number is growing. It's around 14% overall. So health profession diversity challenge was recognized. Lewis Sullivan, as you might remember, was um, head of the Health and Human Services um, under George W. Bush, and in 2002, um, he um, put together a commission, Missing Persons, Minorities, and the Health Professions. And this commission has been driving what we need to do to implement and increase the ability to have a more diverse uh, faculty in the health professions. So um, at Myers right now, we are we're, we look very similar to AANCN's, AACN's report on diversity, but we could do better. So full-time tenure track faculty, of which we have 29, I include men, if you look at this, because men in nursing is a targeted diversity population that all of our um, organizations want to see an increase. So we have 13% minority faculty among our tenure tenure track, 14% in our clinical track, and we have, um, with men, um, that goes a little bit higher. But um, it doesn't look like our student body, which is much more diverse, and our undergraduate enrollment, Amy's nodding this year, our um, undergraduate and our graduate are mostly non-white. So we have a mismatch here that not only means that we have to think clearly about recruiting um, faculty, um, but also that we have a welcoming community and we think about um, that community and how 
um, we teach and how we also address a world that is um, diverse. There are more nurses in the world who are non-white than there are white. The United States and Canada are unusual in that. So we have to look at this from the perspective of the United States and Canada. So recommendations to address this that we just began to discuss at our first meetings this year, academic year, that our diversity and our search committee, based on the recommendations from AACN and the National League and the Sullivan Commission, is look at unconscious, unconscious or implicit bias training, pipeline program partnerships with other schools, um, the University of Maryland, Baltimore, um, Hampton University, things that, the places where um, there are bridges that you can develop to bring people um, to your university from another university or have shared faculty appointments. Um, bridging postdoctoral um, opportunities, uh, ensure diverse members on our search committee and link the, the diversity committee and the search committee so that they, they know that they're working on the same goals together and how do they do that. So in terms of our student body, I started to mention that we're going to attract and graduate a student body that's intellectually curious, globally focused, and aspiring to leadership. And we think we do that very well. You know, the, the students who are here today volunteering um, um, that I want to mention at the end, and I'll call out their names, but uh, th they want to be leaders. And those of you who are students in this room uh, want to be leaders globally, and they want to be leaders um, throughout the country. So um, they need to get there, though, um, scholarships, as Andy was mentioning. So our students um, receive endowed scholarships, um, not only from us, but also for um, those um, external funding that come from the university, and I'll show a slide on that in a moment. We have established this year also an opportunity to move forward in their leadership career through a BS straight to DMP program. And we pilot tested that with three cohorts of small groups. So in other words, students who are coming in to get the baccalaureate degree can start to progress their pipeline right to a doctorate of nursing practice and move forward. So that, that um, is very attractive um, um, to students and something that our peer schools are doing. And we can integrate that career pipeline with our partners um, at Lagone Medical Center, where Kim Glassman, who was our Associate Dean for Partnership Innovation and also Vice President for Patient Care Services, looking at ways so that the pipeline careers can have not just classroom opportunities, but real-time practice opportunities and inform the best practices and the changes that need to go on in both our healthcare delivery. And it makes it very easy now that we're on First Avenue. I mean, it's people are just running up and down the street and in between the buildings, so that works very nicely. We have student leadership uh, seminars, and I want to thank our alumni because we have a wonderful nursing mentorship program with our alumni so that our students can get linked to alumni in real-world situations. One of the challenges that we have had at NYU um, in the last number of years um, and it's a benchmark, and I see Maggie nodding her head. So this is a benchmark that's important to nursing, and our state boards of nursing look at, our crediting bodies look at, and that's something called the first-time pass rate. I want to ensure you that all of our graduates eventually pass the licensing exam, and they do it for the most part the first time they take it. But this first-time benchmark has become like this thing that's very important and measured and gives bragging rights around um, to different schools. So we, um, this year, were at 90% of the number of students who take this licensing pass the first time. But we see it creep down from time to time to 70-some percent, and why is that? So we looked at this, Jim Pace, Emerson E, a couple of years ago. Why did we see these fluctuations? And we looked at the cohort of students who were struggling, and here's what we found. They were students who were um, financially strapped. They finished school broke, in debt, wondering when they were going to be able to pay their rent this month or pay for um, an, a prep exam. 
So we paid for their prep exams and got that. But they had very little time to study. They were also students who may have um, not identified a special disability need for taking multiple choice exams. You sit at the computer and you just got to do this. So we looked at that carefully. And then also, they were folks who, if you looked back, didn't have straight A's in the large science preparatory courses, meaning that they weren't good at taking multiple choice exams. So that, so we focused on those students and moved them forward, but we need to constantly be paying attention um, to that, and that's a benchmark we'd like to see improved. So um, again, thank you to Rory and Howard Myers for this gift. And I want to show you that this is a uh, $30 million gift, as we know, to name the school, divided, as um, President Hamilton said, three-fourths of which goes to scholarships. When we are fully endowed with this, um, we will every year have a dozen fully funded traditional undergraduate students um, for both tuition and room and board and fees. And that means that nearly one-sixth of that class will be fully funded. And that also gives us the opportunity to use the funds that we would use elsewhere toward other students of need in that uh, community, plus our accelerated students. Andy mentioned Pell Grants. So 22% of undergraduate students at NYU are eligible for Pell Grants. 40% of nursing students are eligible for Pell Grants. And why is that? Possibly because nursing is seen as an upward career. Possibly that um, we, we know that we're attractive as a community for people to join. So this is going to enable us to really um, move our whole scholarship agenda. Our enrollment is doing well. Um, one of the things that uh, in the um, total enrollment, we are on target. If you see a little dip, it's because we went up a bit, um, and we want to get back to 1450 total number of students in the program, which is what uh, guides us. The demand for undergraduates, the millennial generation, as we all know, is the largest group um, in a program. Now, the millennials are getting older. They're my kids, they're over 25 to 35, but they are interested in nursing as second careers and they're interested in coming back to school. So we see a lot of them coming into the program and they um, will continue to um, fuel that. One of the things that I've wanted to look at since I arrived very closely is this last column or the number of undergraduate BS students who we yield, we have, or are enrolled. So we accept them and then we want them to come to NYU. We don't want them to go to our other peer schools. We wanna keep them and we wanna be able to offer them scholarships. So we're very good at the PhD. 60% recruitment of a PhD student, that's, that's peer level, that's what everybody's doing, that's what we wanna see. Doctoral DMP, the same thing, very high there, those are, almost selective, there are Kim's folks and others in New York City who want to advance to the DNP and then take it right back to where they work. MS, the same thing. But the traditional undergraduate, this, this BS combines both our accelerated people who are coming back as a second career. So 47% has been on the upward mobility, it was lower. But our traditional undergraduates, that's 60 people we take every year, that was below 30% yield. It's meaning that for all the people we accepted, we only got 30% of the ones that we wanted. That has been going up now to a, a, a couple of percentage points every year to where we want to see it. It's above 30%. So it's a slow build, but it's in the right direction. And that has to do with scholarships and financial aid. Um, our diverse, this is what I was talking about, so that our undergraduate uh, demography of our incoming freshmen um, on the um, purple, of course, is or violet, is NYU Myers. And the white column is the national reporting from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. So on average, around the country, 68% of nurses coming in traditionally are white, and we are at 22%. So we're doing well in this area, as I mentioned before. But these are small numbers, but still, um, we're seen around the country as one, as one of the top 10 NIH-ranked schools that has the most diverse student body. So we're very um, proud of that. 
And of course, men this year were at 20 percent of newly uh, of our new class are, are men, and we've been very uh, much targeting that um, as an appropriate. Um, way to increase uh, nursing and relieve the nursing shortage. You can't do it with one gender, and so that's important. On this slide, I want to give you a sense of what, how we, um, this is the entire school financial aid. So how is it broken down? So the light uh, purple at the bottom is what we get from the university financial aid to give financial aid to our students. And the bottom number is, um, in the last column, it's total of nearly $11 million. The bulk of it comes in the middle purple out of our own funds, our operating funds, so that our discount rate, what we're giving back. And the top dark um, is the scholarships that we're bringing in. And you might see from last year to this year, it's slightly less because there was um, a scholarship that we had um, from an organization every year, and that board uh, refocused its entire um, um, purpose. They're no longer giving scholarships to anyone. So that was a bit of a, uh, an adjustment this year for us, but we also did receive an excellent gift um, from an alumni this year, um, Ms. Teitelman, Ruth Teitelman, who gave us um, a million dollar uh, gift for scholarships, so that helped. But as you see, the important message here is that we're still funding our own financial aid to a great extent for that gap that we have of the Pell Grants and others, and also doctoral funding, and we want to increase the uh, support for our PhD students, because our peers often give four or five years of complete PhD support to um, their um, we've, um, students. We've been doing two years. We're now getting that up to three, and we want to see that, so we attract the best PhD students. We want to engage as another strategic goal in innovation with our interdisciplinary and interprofessional partners throughout NYU, uh, dentistry, global. Uh, we just, as a, we said it was a pre-inauguration uh, conference with uh, the School of Dentistry, the School of Medicine, College of Global Public Health, and our school transforming the whole person colloquium on September 15th and 16th about looking at the intersection of oral health and general medical health, nursing health, and public health, and had leaders from around the country attend that. It was a very successful. Uh, Dr. Judy Haber and Dan Malamud from dentistry led that uh, conference, and it was a great success. And what it will do was really spin off more opportunities. We have um, education in which all three of those disciplines, nursing, medicine, and dentistry, come together to learn together in simulation. Um, about each other's ways of assessing different parts of the body, but that it's a whole person that we want to um, address. So for innovation on October 4th, we have um, launched a half day think tank now called an innovation summit um, with the generous support from the Hillman Foundation and from um, one of our board members, Dr. Jerry Berendes, to take a look at how do we build capacity um, for nursing and technology in a new um, world of healthcare, and how do we innovate? What is the brave new thinking that we need to do? And as a result of this summit, we will come out with two or three ideas that then we'll launch. It's, it's an invitation-only um, event. Um, we have four or five people coming from outside of NYU. We have um, faculty from the Tisch School of Arts, Engineering, Dentistry, Public Health, the Gallatin School, um, joining us as well as some of our own faculty and we'll be really digging into what are the things that we need to do in our curriculum, what are the things that we need to do for practice implementation. So we want to leverage the best practices that we already are doing in technology to enhance education and patient care. We're very pleased that we just uh, received word of new funding, Dr. Mei Fu and Dr. Wang of the School of Engineering, our nursing faculty in engineering, just got an R01 funded, both by a bridge program of NIH and the National Science Foundation for work in lymphedema reduction, and Dr. Wynne Burleson on our faculty as an engineer, National Science Foundation Award. So we have this beginning effort, but where does that drill down into our everyday world of best practices and education and technology? 
So of course we all know our clinical simulation center at this point, where over a thousand students um, have visits every week. This is a wonderful way, this is the way everyone is teaching. Um, this is, um, we're ahead of the game um, in terms of the fact that 50% of our clinical hours are counted in simulation. Our students have great rewards of being able to walk in well prepared to the, um, clinical setting when they do have real-time hours, as you heard them speak to that um, with, um, with the um, a, a video that we saw. The, the interesting thing about clinical simulation that many of my colleagues, uh, deans of other nursing schools are saying, we're now running a practice. You've been through our clinical simulation. It looks like a real hospital or a real home, and people are doing this. And I said, yeah, it's just like it. I can do everything except bill. Meaning that this is a costly enterprise that we, um, as deans of nursing around the country, hadn't built into budgets. It, it came faster than our budgets did. And so how do you manage it with fees? And this has been less for us, but more of a struggle in other uh, schools where people are saying, how do I balance the cost of doing this, but how do I share it? So we have shared simulation up and down the health corridor, as I mentioned, with the School of Medicine as well and um, virtual realities with um, dentistry and thinking about how simulation can come together um, on our learning commons um, in our, in our uh, building. So um, we also wanna, um, I wanted to mention the word delegation here, because you may not know what a delegation is, a delegation of the UN, you feel like you're in the UN today. Um, but delegation has, has been identified by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing as one of the most needed area to make sure that our nurses understand how to delegate. It has both legal function um, for nurses and it has both a reality base. As you have teams, things have to be delegated out, but they have to be delegated out in a way that's safe for patients. And our niche program, Nurses Improving Healthcare System for Elders are addressing this, but as well, um, how do we, so we have a gaming app for how to educate uh, our nurses around delegation and what you do. And Kim is smiling and Maggie is smiling. They under, those who've been in hospital practice for a long time, but in long-term care, delegation is the most important thing that will help nurses deliver care in a better and safer way. How do we get those teams? And we haven't, fully addressed it, and we have to teach people how to do it. Create leadership in the field of healthcare through excellence in research um, and scholarship. So here's um, where we've been on our metrics that we're very proud of. So um, we, in this past year, we were number eight. Most importantly is that a couple of years ago, we broke into the top 10 of the NIH nurse rankings, and we've stayed there for the last five years, and that's where we want to be. So you see these numbers here of us, and we've done that with um, our researchers. Um, we have a very innovative um, group of researchers who are interdisciplinary um, in our a center for Drug Abuse and HIV AIDS Research, um, as well as in our um, aging work and our global research efforts. And the important thing to keep in mind is that this number totally of the top 10 schools of nursing in the country who are in that ranking, it's only $62 million. That's like 0.1% of the NIH budget or something like that. So we're talking small numbers that we're ranking ourselves around going up and down this NIH. So we're very pleased that the budget, we lobby hard, lobby's not the right word, but we advocate hard for more NIH dollars, particularly uh, National Institute of Nursing Research. This number, as you see here, um, as you'll see, um, so we're number eight. We think we'll go up. The numbers usually come out, the rankings around the late fall. We anticipate that we might go um, back up with some new grants that we've gotten in. Um, U.S. News and World Report, we look very good in nursing. They just rank MS programs. So as you see, we have a number of top 10 programs, and, and that's uh, terrific. Uh, this year, one of our goals was to um, get a T32. This is a fund, funding program from NIH for um, pre- and postdoctoral training. So uh, we um, have uh, partnered with a group who will now be part of the College of Nursing um, for a T32 and bio, uh, biobehavioral science training and drug abuse research program. 
This is a partnership that we have with the School of Social Work and Public Health, but it sits under the College of Nursing. And uh, this program has been around since the late 80s and preparing a lot of people and very much focusing on preparing careers for faculty and researchers who come from diverse backgrounds um, to look at drug abuse. And we all know that um, focusing now on substance abuse is extremely important. We hear um, news every day and we see it in our own lives. And this is um, incredibly important. So we're well prepared to take that on. Um, Grant funding, as I, I was mentioning, we, we went down a little bit, a million here, a million there, but I just learned, we, as I just told you, we got another couple million. Um, so we anticipate that this ranking will be um, at 15 million um, going into the ranking, so we feel like we're in good position. That's by the budget year. Um, our faculty um, get funding from, um, 67% of their grants come in research from NIH or Govern NSF resources and 33% from elsewhere. So that's a very important number. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, the, the budget um, shows us that we're not right on target. We, that 96% faculty retention, that 4% person that left took some money with them. But that person, you know, um, was um, going on to um, an excellent leadership position, and that's important, but that's, um, that's one of the things that you see when that happens. This number is wonderful, and um, we have been around 300,000 plus or minus for the last number of years of our tenure, tenure track and research scientists annually bringing in um, $299,000 or so each. That's a lot of work and that, um, that's very important and we stand in good stead in comparison um, throughout NYU. So while our, our $12 million of NIH research fund doesn't look like large numbers, some departments have that much, how or less, but um, one of the important things to keep in mind is the people that we have, while we're smaller, are working extremely hard um, and, and being very successful at it. And, and lastly, one of our strategic goals um, in the last couple of years as we became an independent college and our partnership and alliance with the College of Dentistry and then the new College of Global Public Health was really then also to take a look at structures and processes. And this might be boring and people said, well, do you really need to put that into a strategic goal or is that a tactic? You're never going to let nurses get away with not making process a part of a goal because what we do is process, we implement. So we're always putting process um, very much in the front and I think it served us well because what we needed to do was fortify um, what we were doing. So um, some of the things that we've been doing is greater alignment of our academic programs with one another, so we have a lot, but we've also been focusing very much with NYU Langone Medical Center and how um, the nursing force. So while um, the College of Nursing has faculty and students, there are thousands of registered nurses with advanced degrees at Langone Medical Center that are also part of our community. And, you know, their salaries come through the medical center, but we also share in their everyday experience and their everyday lives, and they help us educate our students, plus they are our students, plus they are also bringing practice to life. And so this report uh, just came out this year um, from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing um, on how to transform um, academic health centers uh, uh, between deans of nursing and, um, and the academic health center. And Kim and I kind of chuckled at this all along because we were looking at this and they came out with all these things you should do and we were like done yesterday, last week. Um, um, in, in some ways, the relationship that Langone, uh, the, you know, with uh, both the, the leadership from Maggie McClure in the 1970s and 80s and Susan Bauer Ferris following her and, and Kim Glass with the College of Nursing has been extremely strong, as well as with um, um, department chairs of medicine, and, and we think this serves us very well, and we are constantly creating new ways to uh, for our students to be learning and our research to be done. Um, as I mentioned, um, our diversity and inclusivity committee has been structured this year as a new committee um, and with chairs, and they're looking this year to really um, 
continued to grow the Estelle Osborne Legacy Month, who was the first African-American nurse uh, faculty member. And so we honor her in February um, with awards, lectures, mentorship activities. Um, we also wanted to improve our communication um, through an intranet that we've created in the college, uh, an improved website, um, and also um, social and multimedia. So I understand that we're now on Snapchat. I mean, I walk around. You're now Snapchatting, you've now been tweeted, you've now been this and that, and that's been um, terrific. So this is our new web page. I encourage you all to take a look at that. And as I mentioned, the leaders, um, Keith and uh, Dave, who really took leadership in that, bringing it in at budget um, and record time. And I want to thank all the faculty and students and staff who participated in getting that up and running because um, it looks terrific. So um, revenue sources, just to um, make a few remarks, we have to have a couple of slides looking at the budget, but here's, here's what to take away from this. These are our, our revenue comes from tuition. This is, this is basically what it's about, and there are a few other things that contribute. Of course, our uh, grants bring in a certain amount of money, which is very good, 17.5%, um, and we have endowment at 4%, um, our faculty practice is very small because we just transitioned that over to Kim and, um, and the, the Langone Medical Center, and it's growing and it's um, uh, doing much better. We have three nurse practitioner faculty members who are practicing at 52nd and 8th, um, and um, they now have space to grow and space to really infuse and seed um, a nursing practitioner practice, which is a goal of the medical center. And um, so that will be coming off of that after next year. Our nurses improving a, a niche program, um, healthcare for elders program, uh, income is a contributor as well. So that's basically to let you know we're tuition driven. And then our expense categories are really about um, salaries and fringe benefits for the most part, and then structures. So um, it's pretty much what you would expect to see, and financial aid is a part of that, as, as you can see. So the more endowment we have, the more that financial aid number can go down. So Brooklyn. So here's, here's the exciting part of what we want to do next. And so we're very successful on Washington Square. We were great on Washington Square at Green Street and on Broadway, 726 Broadway. And then two years ago, we moved to the Health Corridor, and we're just doing great over there. So now we're going to go to Brooklyn. And we've been going to Brooklyn a little bit. You can, from where we are, I did it. You get on the 6 train, you go to Bleecker, change to the F, get off at J Street, pop up, and you're at Metro Tech. It's about seven, six or seven stops, and it was done before I knew it. From Washington Square, it's three or four stops from West 4th Street. So what does this mean, Brooklyn? It really means how are we going to do innovation, and what do we need to prepare for? This is a slide I put together years ago, and I still love it. And the reason I love it, it's because it's the face of all kinds of nurses doing different things. It's nurses who are hugging, nurses who are listening. The history that we have in New York City of the nurses visiting the tenements and going over the roofs. You know, I was inspired by Star Trek as a 13-year-old. So there you have the nurse from Star Trek. And then you have the high tech, you have men in nursing, and you have Florence Nightingale influencing us all, who was an innovator. And so here's how to think about nursing in touch and technology. There are careers that we need to do as part of our Brooklyn career pathways that put together high touch, low tech, low touch, high tech, high touch, high tech, and low touch, low tech. What does that mean? How do we do it? But if we start thinking about this, if you're a high-touch nurse and low-tech, you're someone maybe in palliative care, you're someone who's meeting with families and talking about the importance of that communication, the nurse that you know who was there with the tears, the nurse who you know who was there with the encouragement, the nurse who was there and said, get out of bed. I was that nurse. Um, the nurse who's low-touch and high-tech, so that um, you're doing data science, data management, you're looking at big databases, you're influencing it, you're coming out with reports, you're informing Kim Glassman so she knows how to 
do her budget so that she knows how to create new programs, so she knows how to redo units at a hospital or in community. If you're high touch, high tech, you're an ICU nurse, you've got five bags hanging, you're a biochemical engineer, running all the monitors and looking the patient in the eye and touching their skin. And if you're a low touch, low tech nurse, what is that? You're someone on the phone being a case manager. And that is one of the more important growth areas in nursing right now. So all of those things that we want to think about is for our students in the room, your careers are going to be very different over the next 30 years. So how do we best prepare nurses for future careers? What is that going to look like? And how do we make sure that our um, curriculum is the best in this way, that we're informed by our research, that we're implementing science um, in new ways? And what are these influences that are going on right now that we need to be paying attention to? We all hear about the retirement of the nurse workforce. And then 2008 hit, nobody retired. But eventually, the, the use of nurses who are on average, the average age of a nurse runs anywhere between 45 to 50, is going to change. There are now more millennials than there are baby boomers. So we have to understand that. But we're still teaching in a large part to that boomer era. And we have to teach to the millennial era. And we have to work with the millennials who will be leapfrogging everything that we're doing and leapfrogging nursing because they look at what they're doing and they're excited about the Sim Center. They love that. They love to do that. But they are also um, going to be scratching their heads and saying, well, why can't I just you know, take a picture of this on the phone and you know, someone tell me what to do about it and I'll download it to a pharmacy and it'll show up at my door or something. So those things we need to pay attention to this. And at the same time, we are in the world post-Affordable Care Act where value payment is driving everything. We're going to be translating health delivery to new places. You're going to leave the ICU and go to a rehab or you're going to go to some other place or some other virtual reality that you will get care being delivered by a nurse in a different way. And we will have people who might be constantly vigilant or having you know, the Google glasses that will be informing them of your blood sugar going up or down. Um, and where we want to go with this, so what's important is that, so these careers of the future are going to have to be helping people stay healthy forever, because that's what the baby boomers think they're going to do. Greek, it's very interesting how they keep talking about their health in the presidential debate, because we have this idea that we're never going to be sick. Um, stay healthy forever, recover from illness faster, that's what we're aiming for, and that you live with conditions better. So that is what we need to take um, forward to the future. So the way we've structured this conversation is from today, we had our Dean with Faculty meeting to talk about this. We have today's State of the College, our Board of Advisors a meeting afterwards. We have a wonderful Innovation Summit, as I mentioned, on October 4th, and then an all-school retreat October 18th. So these will all help this conversation move forward, and we'll have some um, real outcomes. So I want to thank you um, for this. And there's a few other people that I want to particularly um, thank, um, as I mentioned, our uh, student volunteers, um, Olivia Supa, Katie Paterno, Megan Monroe, Magdalene Maul, Monica Calcedo. So if you could all wave, they're out there, they're in here, but they've been uh, wonderful helping us prepare this day. Um, Ellen Lyons and Hank Sherwood helped me put all this data together, and I want to thank um, Hank for um, being an innovator in helping me move to these new PowerPoint slide mechanisms. And uh, also want to thank our development team who put this together, Nadej Rock, Michelle Fung, Sally Marshall, Brad Temple. So thank you for uh, listening to this, and I'm going to have Bob Byrne come up and make some closing remarks. So clearly a tour de force, and uh, I'm not going to stand between you and the uh, reception for long. just want to make three points that uh, I think should be clear to everyone. First of all, look, look at the remarkable alignment between uh, Andy Hamilton's com initial comments and uh, the plan for the school. 
Um, everything from diversity to affordability to Brooklyn to science. Uh, it's, it's all there. Um, uh, nursing plays a key role, as Andy said, in moving the university to all of those areas. And um, the, the alignment is going to become more and more important as we go forward. Um, second, I just want to go back and think over the last decade. Um, universities usually move reasonably slowly as uh, governance institutions and around decision making. But over a little over a decade ago, the division of nursing was in Steinhardt. Within the decade, the division moved into alignment with the College of Dentistry. It became a standalone college and then became the Myers College of Nursing, all within a very short period of time. And the remarkable metrics that you see here in science, in enrollment, in diversity are all things that have occurred in dramatic fashion, not slow, not uh, incremental, but really, really in a way that has catapulted this organization into the front ranks of, uh, uh, of nursing. And finally, I'll add my thanks to uh, the Myers family. And you see that, that, you remember back at the slide that showed the scholarships and the funds for research, again, exactly aligned with the, the needs of the profession and the needs of the college. So it's when you get that alignment and you get a group of individuals like you in the room who are really, really working hard, not only uh, for NYU and the college, but to make healthcare better for everyone. It, it really gives you goosebumps and uh, I'm just pleased to be a part of it. So thank you, Eileen. Thank you all for everything you're, you're doing. I want to acknowledge uh, Kim Glassman here. The, the alignment between um, NYU Langone and nursing is really spectacular. Um, I think, as you, as you may know, uh, Kim is an associate dean here in the college, and Eileen attends the chair's meetings uh, at NYU Langone, and I think every time they get together, there's another new program, a new idea. So thank you for everything you do, and uh, I look forward to uh, all the progress that we're going to make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone. So now I think we can uh, transition uh, to a reception and mingling with one another and feeling this excitement. And thank you to all of you. I'm so pleased to see all of our students, faculty, and staff here today. Onward. Onward.